He called after her. Please, he said, bring me a scrap of bread in your hand. As the Lord your God lives, she replied, I have no baked bread, but only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am just gathering a stick or two to go and prepare this for myself and my son to eat, and then we shall die. But Elijah said to her, do not be afraid. Go ahead and do as you have said. But first, make a little scone of it for me and bring it to me. And then make some for yourself and your son. For thus the Lord speaks, the God of Israel. Jar of meal shall not be spent. Jug of oil shall not be emptied before the day when the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. The woman went and did as Elijah told her, and they ate the food, she, himself, and her son. The jar of meal was not spent, nor the jug of oil emptied, just as the Lord had foretold through Elijah. The word of the Lord.
women were by the cross, watching from a distance, the same women who had followed Jesus and looked after him. from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. To Jesus said to his disciples, that is why I'm telling you not to worry about your life and what you are to eat, nor about your body and how you are to clothe it. Surely life means more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds in the sky. They do not sow or reap or gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they are? Can any of you, for all his worrying, add one single cubit to his span of life? And why worry about clothing? Think of the flowers growing in the fields. They never have to work all spring. Yet I assure you that not even Solomon in all his regalia was robbed like one of these. Now, if that is how God clothes the grass in the field, which is there today, and thrown into the furnace tomorrow. Will he not much more look after you, you men of little faith? So do not worry. Do not say, what are we to eat? What are we to drink? How are we to be clothed? It's the pagans who set their hearts on all these things. Your Heavenly Father knows you need them all. Set your hearts on his kingdom first and on his righteousness. And all these other things will be given you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Jesus they say that true holiness is very evident when a memory of somebody continues. And I'd have to say since the canonization of Mary of the Cross, that's certainly the case. I very rarely go anywhere, certainly in Australia, whether it be within the Catholic community or in the bigger community, where people wouldn't have heard of Mary MacKillop. Even people who've got no connection with the church at all in any way, but most people have heard of Mary of the Cross. Quite extraordinary, they know her as Mary MacKillop. It's not only here in Australia, she's a saint of the Universal Church. Like on this day, many, many places, I know in where, particularly where the Josephite sisters are or, or where they have been, but also too where many connections are. But not only that, because this we're such a multicultural land with people from so many different countries. You'd go to, you go to Lebanon this day, you'd go to uh, all, all parts of South America, uh, parts, most parts of Europe, the Americas, people, uh, New Zealand, of course, let's never forget, our very close neighbour, where this day would be a very, very special day, a very special feast day. And it's interesting how it's ever, ever growing. Quite interesting. And uh, probably, it's, uh, uh, I think it says so much. Just on Sunday, we had the feast day, the Transfiguration. Probably most of us... Uh, 
that use that word transfiguration too much. But the Jewish people were very conscious of what transfiguration was all about. It was all about getting a glimmer of God. And Jesus knew that when eventually that the disciples would have you know, they'd have hard times, like all of us. None of us escape them. We have good days and bad days. But he wanted to give them a glimmer, a glimmer of what it's all about. He wanted to give them a glimmer of himself, the risen Jesus. So he brought them up the mountain. He had Peter and James and John with him. You remember that from the weekend. When they're up the mountain, of course, they didn't want to come down from the mountain. They felt, they felt this aura all around them. It felt really good. But they had to come down, we had, they, had to get on, they had to get back on with life again. And of course exactly what did happen, of course, it didn't take them long to forget like most of us. But we have our high points and our low points. And Mary of the Cross, whose feast we celebrate this day, she had many high points. She had many low points as well, many struggles. That's part of, of the discipleship for all of us. But I can assure you one thing, in all our humanness, in all our brokenness, and Mary of the Cross was certainly very human, very broken, like the rest of us, but she was able to become, in all that humanness and brokenness, a holy person. Now you might say to yourself, well, that's good enough for St. Mary of the Cross. But you know what? That is possible for all of us. Because all of us, in all our humanness and everything else, it is possible because the age of miracles is not over to happen. I think so often we make things almost impossible or we get this sense of impossibility. But it's not what's impossible for you and me is not impossible for God. You must never forget that. And I think more than ever, more than ever, people, all people, all people, no matter what their background, culture, faith be, searches for spirituality. We search for spirituality. We're spiritual beings. We often forget this. We're, we're all spiritual beings. You don't have to look far to see it, but it's, it's, it's in, in all of us, each one of us. Now, Mary of the Cross, like you'll find nearly all the saints, but and, 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 and many others who are still journeying, what's, that, there's, there's, it, 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 it's not rocket science. I'll tell you what it is. Even, even an old blade like me has been able to find this out. It's looking at the face of Jesus all around you. And I have no doubt that Mary, Mary of the Cross certainly found it in the Word, in the Scriptures. She had a great love for the Eucharist. But she had a great love for the poor, the most broken, the most vulnerable people. I've been reading the Madonna magazine during this time leading up to Mary's uh, feast, and each day there's a little reflection on the House of Providence, which was over here in the rocks, just on the other side of the harbour there, the city, then around St. Patrick's at Church Hill. And Mary was a great believer in Providence, but she also had this great belief, like her sisters, she saw Jesus in the most broken, most vulnerable, the poor people. That's the key to it. If you watch, if you even come further down the track, you watch Pope Francis, who we probably hear a little bit about him most days. You just watch him. You see he sees the face of Jesus in every sister and every brother that comes his way but particularly those who have got heavy loads to carry. You see it all the time. Do you know what? You and me, if we keep our eyes open, we can see Jesus in every sister and every brother. Sometimes it's a bit hard to see it, 
that you'll always find them there, but in the most unexpected place. Now, if Mary McKillop was in this life now, here with us, what would be her areas of concern? I have no doubt she'd be very concerned about the spirituality of people and nurturing that spirituality. What would she do? How would she go about it? The other thing she would be very concerned about is the asylum seekers, the refugees. And as much as we try to close it out, we've still got thousands of people sitting up there in the ruined Manus Island. We read about it every day. They're going nowhere. We've still got them out here in Villawood, many other detentions. They're not going anywhere. And yet, if we were to raise up as a people, and even as a church, let our voice be heard. Our politicians might start to listen. I think Mary would be, she'd be, she'd be eaten away at that. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. The other thing she'd be very concerned would be about the ever increasing number of homeless people in our city and in our country, all around, not only in the cities, but in the rural areas as well. You'll, you know at present, you've only got to go into Martin Place you see all those igloos there. It's an affront to our politicians. It's a front to many. I'm glad they're there. I'm glad because it's making a statement to us, but do we hear it? Do we want to hear it? Because homelessness is a huge problem in our society, never increasing, and a lot of it's hidden. But Mary would be proactive about that. She'd be also very proactive about the many challenges that we particularly have in our society between those who have so much and those who have so little. And yet so often we close our eyes to that. Now I know I'm speaking to the converted in many ways, but we, you and me too, all of us, like Mary, are very, very powerful people. We're very powerful. And the Lord is with us. He's working in you and working in me. The other thing that has intrigued me, Mary of the Cross, very much like that Sardinian woman we heard about in that first reading this day, she became the instrument. You and me too are the instruments. We're the hands of the Lord as well. And, and never, ever, ever forget that. Never forget it. And the Lord, even though at times the waves look so big and they're very challenging, the Lord will always provide. Yet all of us, I don't speak for myself, but I'm sure many of us worry, we waste so much time anxious about situations. We're so anxious, but we've got to trust. Trust in the Lord. In a, in a, in a trust and trust. The other thing I'm amazed about Mary McKillop is the number of miracles that I hear happening through Mary of the Cross. Some are recorded, some are not. So often people say to me, I've had, I've been, I've had a healing. One member of my family has, a friend has, through the intercession of Mary of the Cross. I don't think I can recall ever hearing so many intercessions through one saint, as I've heard so much of Mary of the Cross. It's quite extraordinary, really, really. And so many of us, we know people, we know even in our own families in the community, maybe even yourself, have been had that wonderful, wonderful privilege. This time last year, on this day, I was flat on my back in St. Vincent's Hospital over there at Darlinghurst. They couldn't get things right. Now, I remember this night having a glimmer of Mary of the Cross, and you know what? She assured me she'd 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 hear, she'd get me she'd ask Jesus to heal me. And you know what? I've never had that problem since since that night. I've got plenty of other problems, let me tell you. But you know what? Quite extraordinary. And I put it down to I, I remember telling this to one of the nurses, and she sort of laughed at me. I know that night, it, but it only took place for one reason 
to help me get on to do the Lord's work. That's the same for all of us. All of us are loved by Jesus. And that was Mary's message to everybody. Let's never forget that. We're all loved. We're all part of his family. So a few little words just to get into our heads on this day of Mary of the Cross. Keep in our minds. And it's all tied up with the whole transfiguration. We've got to have joy. We've got to be joyful people. People of joy. So often when we get around, I know myself, worried about the world, worried about it, so many things. We've got to have joy in our hearts. As Christians, we've got to have joy. We've got to be people of joy. The other thing is, people of hope. People of great hope. Even though sometimes it looks the, the, the cards are stacked against us, as they say. But we've got to have that real sense of hope. Mary never tired of that. At times, I'm sure, like the rest of us, she would have been struggled with it. Be people of hope, prophets of hope. And as Mary would say, and this is her one thing, she, she, providence. The Lord will provide. That requires great trust. So on this day, as Jesus gives us a glimmer of Mary, who was such a faithful disciple, that all of us hand, to, hand over to the Lord, hand over to Mary the cross, all our worries and our anxieties and all those things. And that's all of us, I think this is a real Josephite thing, and it's a certain, and they inherited from Mary the cross. We've got to get on with it. We've got to get on with life. We've got to get on with it. All of us get on with it, but get on with the loving and the serving of Jesus and our brothers and sisters. And we too will inherit that wonderful gift that has been given to all of us on our baptismal day of eternity. I don't think any sister or brother can ask for any more than that. We are very, very blessed people. And again, a very happy feast day to you all, all your families, all your friends, all your connections, right across, right across this land and right across this world of ours on this beautiful feast day of Mary of the Cross.
Let us pray. <coughs> May the sacrament we receive, Lord God, on this feast of St. Mary, tempt us to walk the way of the cross and bring us to the glory of the resurrection through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Just before we do go, in a very special way, I'd really like to thank our singers from um, St. Mary of the Cross, uh, Wakeley, St. Mary of the Cross, McClure College at Wakeley. Thank you very much, our beautiful singers. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, thank you. And I noticed too, there's some school children here from uh, St. Joseph's School at Oyster Bay as well this day, out there near Como, out that part of the world, in, in the Shire. It's great that... St. Teresa Kemper too. Yes, so that's wonderful. So very special welcome to, to those young people as well this day. The other thing, just sort of your own information, is there's another Australian saint that's well on the way. It's ticking over towards sainthood, and that is uh, the Venerable Eileen O'Connor. Eileen, who, uh, who was started off the Our Lady's Nurse for the Poor of Coogee. Some of you would, would have heard about Our Lady's Nurse of Poor. Eileen... Um, uh, her body lays in remains of the convent chapel out there at Coogee. Many people, have, uh, many of you would know about Eileen O'Connor. We're going to hear certainly a lot more about her over the next year or two. And that's also moving. Also, it's just funny. All these people are all associated with the poor and vulnerable people. And because the other man is in front of the moon, as well as for this Charles O'Neill, who started off with the Mr. Paul Society. Mary of the Cross, may you learn to recognise God's will for you and trust in his providence. Amen. May her life of service awaken in you a deep respect for the poor and a strong will for justice. Amen. And may you share in her courage to see with the eyes of Christian love and learn from her holy deeds. Amen. And may Almighty God Bless us all this day, bless our brothers and sisters all over this world about us, particularly this land of the Southern Cross, this land that Mary knew so well, Australia, and over the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Mary. And it's all going to be glorifying the Lord by your life. Thank you. Thank you. Before we sing our concluding hymn, I just want to add my thanks as well to, as, as well to Bishop Terry. But to thank all the ministers who helped out uh, in this liturgy today, the community ministers, the readers, collectors, everyone that's um, been here, and, uh, and especially to our singers as well. And I know that there are some students here from Blacktown as well to add to that number of schools, so we're grateful that you've come. And we're very happy that you've all been here today joining us in this wonderful celebration. And so I invite you to continue your celebration with us. The chapel is open for private prayer and for visits to the tomb of St Mary McKillop. The museum entry is free. Don't often get anything free this, this day and age, but anyway. The museum entry is free today and Mary McKillop at Ithaca Goods, along with food and drink, are on sale in the grounds over behind us. After Mass, we ask you to vacate these seats as soon as you're able to because as you know, the next Mass, people are already beginning to come for the next Mass, so we'd be very grateful if we could do that. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the feast day and let us all see now we are travellers here.
everyone. Thank you, everyone. Fitzroy, Maria Ellen McKillop, was born in 1842. At 18, she was offered a position of governess to her cousins, John, Sarah, Mary, and Maxie Cameron in Panola, South Australia. It was here that she first met Father Julian Tillerson Woods, the parish priest, and priest in charge of a vast area of 56,000 square kilometres of South Australia. When Mary was first in Panola, the uh, foundation of the Josephite sisters arose out of the fact that she had felt from early on in her life a great uh, desire to serve God for helping those in need. And so Father Woods was riding around on his horse and he saw that the children of the district had no education of any sort, religious or secular, and the needs came together. And so she was the foundress and he was the founder. With Tennyson Wood's assistance, Mary and her sister Annie would eventually open the first St. Joseph's School for underprivileged children in an old disused stable in Panola in 1866. It wasn't long before other young women came to join her, and so the congregation of the Sisters of St. Joseph of the Sacred Heart was born. I think the important thing to remember is that all of us were birthed at Panola. We have Josephites working in rural areas because uh, right from the beginning that was Mary's emphasis. We began in a rural area in Panola. The seed that was sown in Panola grew into a huge organisation which even surprised her. And she said to Father Woods at one stage, we had no idea what this was going to turn out to be. She set up a system of education that provided 
an excellent secular education, but it was one that was imbued with the spirit of Catholicism. And that is what made it different from anything else offered here at the time. And in her school were not only Catholic children, but also Protestant children. In 1867, a new stone schoolhouse was built, and Mary taught here before she moved on to Adelaide. It featured a large schoolroom with two smaller rooms attached and was built close to the chapel at the foot of Father Wood's garden. In all, Mary founded over 80 schools in South Australia and, generations later, the beliefs and traditions of the Sisters of St Joseph continue at the Mary MacKillop Memorial School. So, I think one of the greatest legacies in Australia is um, education. Like if you look at what we've got in our, in our Catholic system of education, that started with Julian and Mary.
With Tennyson Wood's assistance, Mary and her sister Annie would eventually open the first St. Joseph's School for underprivileged children in an old disused stable in Penora in 1866. It wasn't long before other young women came to join her, and so the congregation of the Sisters of St. Joseph at the Sacred Heart was born. I think the important thing to remember is that all of us were birthed at Panola. We have Josephites working in rural areas because uh, right from the beginning that was Mary's emphasis. We began in a rural area in Panola. The seed that was sown in Panola grew into a huge organisation which even surprised her. And she said to Father Woods at one stage, we had no idea what this was going to turn out to be. She set up a system of education that provided an excellent secular education, but it was one that was imbued with the spirit of Catholicism. And that is what made it different from anything else offered here at the time. And in her school were not only Catholic children, but also Protestant children. In 1867, a new stone schoolhouse was built, and Mary taught here before she moved on to Adelaide. It featured a large schoolroom with two smaller rooms attached and was built close to the chapel at the foot of Father Wood's garden. In all, Mary founded over 80 schools in South Australia and, generations later, the beliefs and traditions of the Sisters of St. Joseph continue at the Mary MacKillop Memorial School. greatest legacies in Australia is um, education. Like if you look at what we've got in our, in our Catholic system of education, that started with Julian and Mary.